All right, so I don't get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Antu Nguyen. I am um, a director of strategic partnerships at Democracy at Work Institute, and also, which is a member of uh, the Owner to Owners um, hotline, which is an initiative employee ownership NYC. Thank you all who were able to attend today. Really appreciate the time you're taking out of your day for, for this. Um, so just as a matter of um, tech reminders, um, if you can keep yourselves muted, any questions that you have, if you can put into the chat and then also introduce yourselves um, in the chat as well. So share who you are, um, where you're coming from, your business, your organization and what borough. Um, and then if you can please leave that in the chat, that would be very helpful for us all. So we have a really great panel discussion planned for today that features the experience of storefront retail businesses here in New York City and how they have been faring before, during, and um, now emerging out of COVID. We'll have a short Q&A session following our panel. Um, so all participants, please save your questions till the end, or if you have any that you wanna put a pin in, um, put them in the chat. Um, and uh, we're going to, um, just to speak a bit to what uh, this initiative is about. Owner to Owners is a hotline um, brought to us by um, the city of New York through the Mayor's Employee Ownership NYC program. And it's um, we have some, some folks today that can speak to worker ownership and how transitioning to employee ownership specifically is a great way to not just preserve a business's legacy, but also um, keep uh, wealth in the community and now and for years to come. So I'll pass it off now to um, Rebecca Lurie, who is leading our panel. Thank you. Thanks, Antu. And welcome, everybody. Um, so Rebecca Lurie, she, they pronouns, and I work at CUNY at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, <clears throat> where I was able to luckily found a project called Community and Worker Ownership Project and I get to do all kinds of things in our communities around transferring ownership to the people who work at live and play in those spaces. So, um, and I'm gonna introduce speakers in a moment, but what I wanna say is um, I've recently decided to say what my theory of change is. My theory of change is like that, maybe like a two-year-old in, in a playground. I want that, like that. And I think if we see what other people are doing and we can say we want to be like that, it begins to model for us what we need to do, it can do, want to do. And one of the important things of like that, that we want to actually raise up is what it looks like when people feel free and liberated like that. And what does it look like at work when people feel that way? And what can we do so that we create spaces at work that uh, allow people to be more their full selves like that. So today we're going to introduce uh, two, two businesses that have become cooperatively owned and run and we're gonna ask how they did that and, and what took place. Um, I think uh, that's probably what I needed to start with. And I, um, I'm going to, I guess, I didn't even think about this fully. Um, I won't fully introduce the speakers. I'll have each one do that. And in that, I'll have them each give a little bit of their origin story. We're going to hear from Red from Blue Stockings, uh, Catherine from Samayana Co Yoga Collective. Um, and they're going to explain how they became cooperatively owned and run. And then I'm going to ask um, Gaspar from the Lower East Side Employment Network speak about how that's important. And we'll do a round of questions and answers. It, it might be the best way to go about this. And so let me begin by um, reaching out to Red from Blue Stockings, uh, a business on the Lower East Side, a bookstore, an indie bookstore, which I have come to admire over the many years. And Red, uh, introduce your business and tell us in, 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 in the short version, the elevator pitch version, because the long story is so wonderful, we should all want to know it fully. But the, the short story of um, how you came to become cooperatively owned and run from whatever that transition was before to now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thanks to all y'all for um, 
having us in the space um, today, this virtual space today um, with all of y'all to talk about what we think is an incredibly important topic, which is how workers can really own, control, make decisions um, and uh, make the best of, of our laboring experiences, right, um, in, this, in this world. Um, so my name's Red, I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm a worker owner cooperative member at uh, Blue Stockings Cooperative, um, formerly Blue Stockings Bookstore, Cafe and Activist um, Center on New York's Lower East Side. Blue Stockings has been a just <laughs> an amazing, safer space um, for, for folks um, in New York's Lower East Side for over 21 years. Um, it was primarily, though, a, a volunteer-powered endeavor, um, which in a lot of ways is how that plucky, just punk rock, amazing, queer, um, gorgeously ramshackled project was able to maintain itself for so long. Um, and also why um, it, we started looking deeper into how to create sustainable models um, because for so long we relied on that volunteer labor and power to make that feminist um, space possible. Um, because rents, as you know, are, are so high. And so for 21 years, um, we collectively made decisions. Um, we enlisted tons of volunteer um, labor to, to create that space. Um, and then COVID hit um, prior to that, we had really tried to look inward and, and figure out, okay, how can we maintain this space? I've been a part of this amazing bookstore project um, and community space for just four years. Um, folks had been um, with the project for much longer who were still with this formation. And we really just asked ourselves those questions. How do we take, continue to take care of our community members and ourselves as we're trying to maintain the space? And with the pandemic, there were so many new questions, so many new obstacles and fears. Um, and also there were potential solutions um, and points of inspiration from other worker-owned cooperatives around the country. Um, and we had thankfully lots of support that we could enlist from other organizations. And we'll, we'll talk about that more soon. But primarily what I wanna say about this is this transition was brought about, this formalized worker cooperative transition was brought about because we believe the people directly facilitating the work of our space and all spaces should be in control of all decision-making, profit redistribution, community outreach and interests and day-to-day -day operations. Um, those of us at Blue Stockings believe that the greatest stopgap while we're surviving under late stage capitalism is to bolster cooperative working formations in which the workers make the decisions about our conditions of labor and the intentions of our business. And we also think that organized workplaces and spaces create those conditions to realize our collective power while at work. Um, and so that's why we chose to formalize our two decade plus collectively run volunteer formation into a worker owned cooperative, um, taking the lead from incredibly formative traditions um, on the left of community resilience um, and really like radical revolutionary praxis. Um, all of our worker owners come from the communities we serve most frequently. And so by removing these hierarchical stratas of bosses and managers, we ourselves are able to self-determine and assess the growth of our business. Um, so that's the little um, quick version of, of the why. Um, and it really is about this vision for a better working world. Thanks so much, Red. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Catherine to do some of the same and then we'll, we'll probably circle back to many of the things you brought up. Thank you. Catherine. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so just a quick little origin story. Um, basically, Samam Kaya is a startup co-op. We, we were not a conversion, um, but we are a um, boutique yoga studio based in Chelsea. And we've been open for about six years now, uh, extremely committed to uh, disability justice, making sure that all bodies have access to yoga. Um, most yoga classes are not appropriate for students with a herniated disc or scoliosis or a fused spine. And so our classes are specifically geared toward alignment and posture and having all kinds of different props to make the poses accessible and healing so that it's a therapeutic space. And, um, and so 
when we started, um, I was not actually with the co-op originally. Um, basically, it was a number of teachers working at another studio, which was um, you know, a traditional studio where most of the teachers were independent contractors, 1099s. And um, it was two directors, basically. And this group of teachers felt that they could better serve their, um, their own interests and create the kind of emotionally healthy space that they wanted if they went on their own and started a, a cooperatively run business. So even though it, it has the feel of a conversion, it's, it's not a conversion because the, uh, the former business partnership was dissolved and then the co-op started right around the time that the um, Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative or WCBDI was also starting. So they were able to get support from the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives to help start up the business. Thank you, Kat. Kat. And, and I, I would say that that's a different type of conversion, even though we usually we say it's like either or startup or conversion, but there is something that happens when the workers themselves grab hold of the the loose entity, the, the, the lack of entity, maybe the gigification of their work and together come together and actually control something new, that that's converting from a, a malaligned work uh, uh, structure to say we now own and run it. Sometimes we even hear stories of where the workers um, occupy the factory and go ahead and do it. So um, there are different types of conversions and I think that's important to understand that people with skills who've been forced to sort of be in and unhealthy work arrangements can take a, take a stand and say, we're gonna own and run it, which is different from a straight up startup where no one was in the business before or in the sector before or doing it. But what I wanna do is um, actually invite Gaspar to introduce himself and, and he represents in the Lower East Side Employment Net in Network. Um, and in that way, you really, Gaspar, you are an intermediary and we, I noticed um, from the participants list that there are others like you who come out of sort of workforce development or business development and are in that middle space. And so I wanna just sort of honor that, that space of where we make connections and you can identify both what you do and what you think businesses you work with would want to know from Red and Kat. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and to the other speakers today, Red, Kat. Um, the whole owner to owners team and for everyone attending today to learn more about this initiative. Um, so I'm Gaspar Caro, the partnership director for the Lower East Side Employment Network. We're a group of nine social service organizations uh, with either headquarters or major program sites in the neighborhoods of Chinatown, East Village, Lower East Side, uh, or Two Bridges and Two Bridges. And um, we as a group provide employment services, uh, but in addition, many other social services, uh, but as a collaborative, we focus on employment. And um, the premise is pretty simple for those of you who may be unfamiliar with workforce development and, um, and for those of you who are quite familiar, the, the industry uh, focuses on training people who are underemployed, unemployed, or looking for a transition to make a positive impact in their uh, employment journey uh, to, to either gain a new job or improve their existing job uh, for the betterment of, of their livelihood, communities, and families. Um, and, you know, we serve as the local hiring vehicle for Manhattan's Community District 3, which encompasses the neighborhoods I mentioned. Uh, the community board is a co-founding member as well. And um, in workforce development, traditionally, organizations and providers are positioned to compete against one another. Um, and it's a very competitive environment because uh, we are all held to performance-based contracts where we have to deliver a specific number of hires, a specific num uh, minimum wage that we're trying to connect uh, people to, and also to serve businesses at a specific volume. So the funding is really structured for us to compete against one another. And our network flips that so that we collaborate um, and share in the resources we have access to, uh, be it candidates we're trying to recruit, businesses we're wanting to connect with, um, and even sometimes fundraising. And from our perspective, you know, this is an exciting opportunity uh, because it's really bringing all of those players into the room and, uh, um, and working to encourage um, and benefit 
uh, businesses. And, you know, the other aspect of workforce development is that it's really not structured to help small businesses. Because I mentioned, you know, it's all about volume and performance. Um, you know, there's a real strong need, uh, I believe, uh, for, for small businesses and workforce development fields to collaborate uh, uh, in order to, to serve small business needs. And uh, with owner to owners, what I think is exciting is that um, this isn't a threat to um, individual ownership. Uh, this isn't a, you know, a loss for owners who would be, you know, inviting employees to share ownership with them. This really is like a supplement to empower your businesses to succeed and thrive. Um, and, you know, employees can contribute to the value of businesses, not just as workers, but also as shareholders, um, decision makers, et cetera. So, you know, I, I don't want to lose too much of the audience um, possibly kind of like an inside language about uh, labor empowerment, uh, workforce empowerment, but just for everybody to know and trust um, that even though we are in late stage peak capitalism, um, that this uh, campaign and this initiative um, will be working to still bolster and encourage um, owners to thrive and employees and workers to thrive together uh, for the betterment of their communities and, um, and their constituencies. So that's a point I did want to make um, and comment on. Um, so I'll, I'll yield at this point. Rebecca, thank you for the introduction and moderation. Thank you, Gaspar. There is a, a very deep joy I get when somebody else says what I wanted to say, because then we are in alignment. And we've only met a little bit, but we've picked up on that. you know. And, and I think recognizing both we don't want to lose people's attention in the room um, there, there's always been a, a tension of like business as usual, we got to make sure business can succeed as usual versus um, how do we make work the best experience it can be for people and that might look different than as usual. So this bottom up structure of control ownership and control is actually a structured way to shift some of the power dynamics at work that I think help help us prefigure the world we want to be in. I think prefiguring is a word I've used a lot to say. The, the, the system's not working for us and people can talk things like socialism, communism, capitalism, all of that hardly matters what words we use. How do people feel better about the work they do and their contribution to the economic life of our neighborhoods and our sectors? And how do we help people do that? And certainly in workforce development, there's been a lot of giving people some basic skills but now we're looking at a different set of skills, the skills of actually running, running the entity. And so um, that, that's a lot of lineup and connection to what you raised, Gaspar, and what um, Red and Kat actually experienced day to day in your business. So I wanna turn this actually to a very particular problem called uh, the pandemic and two problems. I'm gonna align these two problems and I'm gonna ask you to speak to them. Uh, what the pandemic did for your business and how you might have handled it and how that was handled cooperatively. What, what was the cooperative structure doing for you to move through that? And New York City real estate. <laughs> um, those are two different things. They overlap hard in, uh, in these times. Um, but the, the common thread I'm really going to is how did your cooperative structure help you manage through this time? And I guess we can start with you, Red. I see your head going up and down, and we, and then Kat. Sure, thank you. I mean, yeah, these are these are the questions, right? Um, and these are the things that we're beginning to take time to reflect on now that we're fourteen months, um, you know, past when um, our worlds radically changed. COVID um, changed a lot. Um, for so many in our neighborhood um, and, and around the world um, and specifically um, impacted Blue Stockings um, in a number of ways that also do dovetail with both of these questions, um, Rebecca, in terms of our, our lease at our old location was coming up in April. Um, and we had already been engaged in a, in a very long, I'll call it politely a dialogue um, here, um, since we're recording, uh, with our with our old landlord, and 
our beautiful, our beautiful space <laughs> was in quite a bit of disrepair. Um, she needed help structurally. She needed a new floor. She needed a new ceiling. Um, she needed an accessible bathroom. Um, and these were things that we really wanted to encourage the former landlord to, to help us realize or to at least allow us to realize um, by bringing in contractors, by assessing damages um, over like structural damages over many, 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 many years. Um, and we were unable to, to reconcile during this, this dialogue um, and more money was being demanded of us all the time. Rent was going to go up in the midst of the pandemic. We were fearful. Um, we thought our space would not survive. Um, and we decided to take a colossal risk as a collective at that time, because this is pre-transition to a cooperative, formalized cooperative structure. And so a very small team of five people um, who were the collective at the time, um, we had an online check-in and we were like, something's got to give. We have to take risks. We have to figure out how to, how to move this forward um, and navigate the incredible amount of harm reduction work we were doing in the neighborhood at the time. Uh, we were providing a warming and cooling center. We were providing free menstrual products. We were providing fentanyl testing strips and Narcan trainings for overdose prevention, water and affordable coffee um, to all of our neighbors in a non-judgmental space and a place to pre-COVID shelter in space safely, right? Um, so many of our neighbors are, are houseless or, or housing insecure in the Lower East Side. Um, and it is absurd that our little bookstore was providing so much that truly our, our city um, could have been providing quite a bit more of, but we were doing it, we were doing the work um, and we had to figure out how to shift in this moment of the pandemic, not just our physical space, but all of the kind of service provision that our independent bookstore was providing to our people. Um, and it was a colossal undertaking. Um, and we decided to continue to do street-based outreach stuff, tap into the forming mutual aid networks and other existing organizations in our neighborhood and kind of give people power, time, resources where we could to fortify those community networks and look for a new space. Um, and it has been an uphill battle, um, but it has also been a true test in like collective and cooperative resiliency and um, in the face of exhaustion and colossal fear. Um, but yeah, our chief struggles remain renting. They remain being renters and tenants for, for landlords. That's a chief, that's still chief, even in the big new beautiful space that we have, it's still a number one issue. Um, an obstacle and struggle for us um, in this neighborhood that is so gentrified and still and continues to be rapidly gentrifying to be a legacy store of you know going on um, 22, 23 years now. Um, it will be, I believe in, in June. Um, this is still an ongoing struggle for us. That changing landscape of regulation, right, to in the midst of COVID um, that happens on the whims of politicians that doesn't always feel rooted in community safety. Again, all of these things are still with us, even as the masks are coming off, right? So I'll just, I'll wrap there um, to say it's, it's been a struggle, but it has also showed us how we can overcome and navigate so much cooperatively. Kat, please, thank you, Red. Maybe you can read my lips. But Kat, <laughs> tell us your, your real estate story. I know you've been involved in a lot of the land use issues in New York as a small business. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Red, for sharing your story. It's, that's really inspiring. And, um, and a lot of that resonates with me too. Um, I, yeah, the pandemic has obviously rocked all of our worlds. Um, obviously, as a a physical yoga studio that had to close our doors. That was <laughs> pretty um, traumatic. Um, but I do feel that having our cooperative structure um, really was one of the main things that helped us to get through this past year. Um, basically, when we you know, received the state order to close our doors, um, we went into emergency mode. And we, as, as Red said, we had these 
emergency check-ins. We all got together, all 20 of us on Zoom for about a week or two um, because we needed to figure out what was the best way forward, not just for our business, but for each other. And so we we made a lot of adjustments. We divvied up the, um, the tremendous task of researching different, okay, what what online platforms can we use to switch our classes to online? Um, what grants might, might we be available to help cover the cost? Um, and you know, taking workshops, doing research, we all divided the labor. And because of that, because it wasn't all on the, the shoulders of one boss, um, I think that that truly helped us to get through it. Um, we were able to open our virtual studio studio two weeks after closing our physical doors and um and and that was huge and i also think that because we are a cooperative you know we're part of a very supportive community and um we were able to get grants from different uh organizations that support cooperatives including the cooperative economic uh, economics alliance of new york and um and I'm going to put the other one in the chat because I can't remember it right now. But um, that felt really, really powerful and moving. And also um, because of all the great ad advocacy work that goes on, even at the national level, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives did work to make sure that worker cooperatives would be eligible for the PPP loans. And so we were able to get a PPP loan and... Um, and we were also incredibly fortunate that we had a somewhat lenient landlord. So we were actually able to negotiate um, a rent deal with our landlord. And, um, and that was also due in a, in a large way because of our co-op community, we were able to have access to um, one of uh, the WCBDI partners, Take Root Justice, gave us some advice on how to like understand our lease and approach those negotiations. Uh, we also got some assistance through the commercial lease assistance program later on to continue those negotiations. So um, that's really what kept us going. And in fact, um, you know, everybody really came together. And even though we were barely making half of what we normally make when the studio is open, uh, we were able to, to keep it going through the year. We even had a very generous donor who allowed us, made it possible for us to offer free or donation-based classes to students who asked for it, who couldn't afford class. Um, and, and so we really met the challenge, but it, it's not to say it was all roses. It was definitely a struggle to get through. There were definitely some, you know, differences of opinion. Um, you know, some, some folks, felt maybe we shouldn't keep the physical space because we didn't know how long the pandemic would go on. Maybe we should just invest all our energy in online yoga. And um, so there were a lot of difficult conversations, but um, in the end, we ended up signing a new lease for 10 years. And so we still have our space and we just reopened our classes a couple weeks ago and they're very limited now. They had to go up in price, but thank you very much, everybody. We're really excited. So we have small classes you can come check out, but we still have our virtual classes. So we have about one in-person class a day and the rest are online. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just really proud of our little business and, um, and appreciative of all the support we got along the way. I love it. So I want to, um, gosh, we're moving through our, our time allotment for this panel. And I, although I have more things, I'm going to just pitch it straight to Gaspar as an intermediary who cares a lot about business growth in your community and worker uh, power, worker, you know, good work lives. You know, what are you hearing? What do you wonder about? What do you think um, might be useful? Especially because again, when I look at the participants list, there are others like you who are those in that space of intermediary between business and community. Yeah, um, you know, I think that uh, I really appreciate Red's comments about how painful this pandemic and economic crisis has been. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's the case really across the board, except for maybe um, shareholders and traders um, on the stock market. Um, the reality is everybody else has, has really been struggling. Mental health, um, you know, public health, uh, economic uh, health, let's call it. 
Um, and really, you know, I walk down the street to the Lower East Side, Chinatown, foot traffic is down. Uh, you know, I don't know the exact percentage, but I feel like I see a four lease or four rent sign, um, you know, every few storefronts. Um, and it's been really tough. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, from my perspective in, in supporting uh, candidates, you know, who primarily are low income in connect to connecting to work that is, um, you know, fruitful uh, and also to help businesses thrive. Uh, I think that there's a lot of common ground and that this is an exciting opportunity to band together uh, for those businesses, the owners and workers to thrive. Um, and, you know, for the, from my perspective in, in collaborating and communicating with small businesses, the amount of time, dedication, passion uh, required is far, far too exhausting for me to ever want to be a small business owner. Um, so I, you know, from my perspective, uh, part of the challenges for small businesses in working with workforce development is just the limited capacity. Uh, you know, rent is so high, uh, labor costs are really high. Uh, you're trying to juggle payroll. You're trying to juggle insurance. Um, you know, utilities, all the all the logistics. Also, you know, manning or staffing uh, your counter. Um, you know, the the counter facing customer facing counters. Etc. is is just a lot. Um, plus, you've got your personal life, you know, children, family, etc. Um, so, you know, in order to to bring some quality of life back to for people, I think that um, being able to show that employees can contribute to a lot of those managerial dynamics um, is important. Uh, and again, like I said, for all to 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 really lift up. Um, and you know, from Again, like from my perspective, I think that uh, a lot of those pain points may not be in our control or in, in certain people's control. Uh, some of it really is. And I think um, that that collaboration is, is really a, a good example. Um, and, you know, wherever we can reduce the costs and uh, pain points for business owners and workers, um, whatever we can do, we should really strive for. Uh, so, you know, what is that? I think that the employee ownership, you know, by empowering workers, you know, they're going to share in some of those pain points um, and uh, will will allow for the business to, to thrive. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the thought process that I'm bringing into this conversation um, and something that I'm encouraged to see. Uh, you know, the structures in place are, are currently just really not uh, positioned for, for individuals and small businesses to really flourish and thrive. Um, and we need to, to take this moment to think about whether the way things were really were working, not just the way things are, um, and that going forward, we can really see a new vision uh, for what um, business and uh, work looks like. Thanks, Gaspar. Again, um, I'm going to use some things you said just to leverage the next round of questions. Um, because how, how we find our power, how a business finds its power when so stressed, as you mentioned, you know, the, all the pressures. And then Kat and Red each spoke about what they had to do on a dime with COVID, with landlords. So there are two different ways to go at this. How do we empower? the workforce, the team to come up with solutions? What does that messy democracy look like when it can look like actually empowering? Um, it may take time, but it may be more powerful. So there's one question I'm looking at like from the grassroots, how we find our strength in that. And the other is sort of from the top down or from the outside in, what resources you've used from the city. And this might be the most important thing for us to end on, but I don't wanna leave out what democracy looks like. For, in the first line of questioning and the second one is really what resources have you used from the city because our tax dollars and I want to underscore our tax dollars, our money has gone into something called WCBDI, the worker co-op business development initiative, which then gave birth to uh, this initiative, 
owner to owners as a hotline, and there are now technical assistance providers, many of whom are on this call and we'll hear more. But how did you use some of that tax dollar provided TA services to help you figure this out? And what does democracy look like when it both is messy and empowering? So forget about, you know, take your time, wind down with those thoughts. And, and Gaspar will take this to our communities and to our businesses as they try to figure out the hard work of making it work. A red or cat, either one of you wanna go first, you can say so. Cat, why don't you go for it and then I'll follow up. Thanks so much. Could you just quickly repeat the question? <laughs> it was really two things and you could pick and choose. What technical assistance providing providers do you use to figure out your solutions, but also the other, the other set of solutions that comes from the grassroots, the people, which is, uh, you each said in our prep conversations that, you know, democracy is messy, but wonderful, sort of in different ways. So what did that look like in your team? And, you know, um, uh, a shameless plug, I teach cooperative management now at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. And so in that teaching, I know, um, you know, all the different ways we can make it work and it, it gets hard to work. So, you know, how did you make those decisions that you had to make and where does that actually lead to empowerment? Thanks so much uh, for the question, Rebecca. Um, so I would say, um, you know, with the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, there are 13 different organizations that offer different kinds of support. So, um, you know, throughout the years, we, we've worked mostly with NICNOC. Um, NICNOC has a, a wonderful program called the Principle Six Program. And if you're not familiar with uh, the seven principles of worker cooperatives, I highly recommend you look them up. Principle Six is about um, uh, co-ops uh, working together. Um, and so through that program, um, we've been able to get um, free business cards for all our teachers um, printed by Radix Media, which is another co-op in the city. Um, we've also sought out um, assistance with BACnet, um, you know, when we needed marketing help. Uh, we've reached out to Canva for similar issues. And, um, and now we're uh, looking outside the initiative with an organization called Lift Economy um, to help us with some some of our kind of structural and communication processes. Um, and because those things are really hard to figure out and if you don't really lay them out in the beginning, um, it can get pretty tricky down the road. And so, you know, now we're in a place where, you know, we've been around six years and, um, and certain things are coming to the surface where we're realizing, wow, this, this, is, a, this is a void that we, probably should have addressed before, but didn't realize we needed to. So, um, so that, that is one of the reasons I, I say democracy is messy, but worth it because, you know, you don't even, you, it's hard to anticipate the kinds of issues that you'll run into. Um, and so you just have to kind of work on them as you go along and figure out what, what, how, how you want your governance to be and how you want to develop those communication structures so that everyone in the co-op feels respected and appreciated and and that's hard to do um you know our co-op has a more kind of i would say in a way a more traditional structure because we have you know a group of managers that basically who take care of all the day to day. And we have a group of board of directors who kind of oversees the, the long-term vision and, and mission of the co-op. And so most of the other faculty members, um, we can get involved in uh, committees like the finance committee or um, one of the special programs committees like our advanced studies or adaptive yoga. But for many members, we're just, you know, there one or two hours a day and it can be hard to kind of remind folks that they are owners of this business and, and that we all need to take ownership to um, make the business thrive. And, and so that's a real kind of cultural difference in this capitalist world that we live in. Um, people aren't used to working together cooperatively. And so it really takes a lot of education and, and support in order to um, really kind of engender those those ideas and those values in a business today, I feel. Um, and, 
you know, but, but we're also very lucky that, you know, with almost 20 worker owners, we have a wide variety of skill sets. So one of our worker owners does our bookkeeping and one of our worker owners kind of, she does our, um, our profit loss analysis once every quarter and another worker owner has a lot of experience in the corporate world. So she oversees like operations type things. And um, so we have a lot of different, um, you know, in, in addition to every teacher being an amazing, like alignment oriented therapeutic yoga teacher, we also have these other skills that um, people can contribute. And even if you don't have a skill, you can learn it. That's another part of being a cooperative. You can develop your own skills. Like I'm horrible with finance. So I joined the finance committee so that I could try to learn about how to do finances better. So it's really something cool about, you know, your own personal growth uh, develops in ways you might never have anticipated um, if you had just, you know, stayed in a traditional business with a boss and a manager telling you what to do and not really giving you any buy-in. So I hope that answered your question. Very much so. And I saw Red's head shaking uh, so much, which sort of means, yes, yes. So take the last two minutes of this section of our talk, that's one and a half minutes, um, to, to wind down to what this means for blue stockings, your experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Kat, I'm just, yeah, there's so much, there's so much there that we could talk about the cultural shifts toward really embracing agency and autonomy in the workplace um, and feeling like a worker owner as employee, as opposed to the kind of employee mentality that is, is really kind of forced down our throats from day one, right. Um, under this like economic um, disaster. Um, anyway, reining it in. Um, We've gotten so much support and love from um, WCBDI um, affiliated organizations um, and, and projects. And to be perfectly honest, because of just the intense um, amount of work, we've been underutilizing these resources. And so um, I'm taking this moment to name that we're gonna be utilizing them so much more. <laughs> this is setting intentions now. Um, but we wouldn't be able to have, we wouldn't have been able to reopen or to be in this moment without the help of ICA, without the help of Take Root Justice. There are folks on this call right now um, who have been incredibly and tremendously supportive of us. We have a call with ICA um, later today for some legal advice and help. Um, so all that is to say is reaching out um, and, and taking, um, kind of hold of, of our kind of financial future and our business's future as worker owners um, has, been, has been hard, um, but there are these organizations that we, um, we've relied upon. I will say that messiness point, right? Uh, which is so important. It's important to name that this, it's a struggle. Um, it, this is not an easy journey, but it is an important and a necessary one, I think to really reduce harm to our communities um, and to empower folks who are living and working in our communities to have that wealth held in the neighborhood, right? To have that power, that collectivity, that decision-making, that vibrancy held in one's own neighborhood is a political legacy that Blue Stockings is very proud to, to, to be in. Um, and I think that making that democracy happen in action um, you know, we rely on a horizontalist feminist um, analysis and approach for our work. Um, and that looks like doing consensus-based decision-making, which takes so much time, so much time um, and energy, but it's important because it's conflict forward and conflict brave. And it means that we're showing up for ourselves and each other by taking that patient time to arrive at that same page um, and to create solutions, become creative and imagine different ways of being in right relationship with one another as fellow worker owners, right? And also by extension, our, our own communities and neighborhoods, right? And so that messiness, is how life is anyway. And so this is acknowledging it and embracing it and, and looking to how we can actually care for community and not think in these very confined ways um, that feel very kind of like punishment oriented or exclusive um, and rather kind of embrace um, the messiness and learn to, and grow together. Um, so I'll, I'll say that and, and also just echoing so much of what Kat named around, it's an ongoing um, cultural shift 
these are ongoing dynamics we interrogate within ourselves and um, and yeah, it's an exciting process and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this like very beautiful radical experiment in creating cooperative structures. Thanks, Red. There's an African um, expression that I learned from the working world that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And it may feel slower, but it gets further, more together. So with all that, I want to uh, turn it over to Julianne. We'll figure out, I know there are some good uh, comments in the chat and um, people can look at that and we can uh, see if we come back to that after Julianne will, will take us to the last section. Thank you so much to the panelists. Love hearing your stories and it was just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, owner to owners now, but I want to thank you, uh, thank our panelists, first of all, for um, really sharing their great experiences. Um, if you do have questions for our panelists or about owner to owners, please include them in the chat so we can make sure that we get them answered. Um, for the business owners in the room, uh, you're all familiar with making difficult decisions and finding solutions to the challenges entrepreneurs face. Uh, it's something you do every day. And we've just had the pleasure of hearing firsthand some of the benefits of employee ownership, including how it has helped local businesses overcome unique and unforeseen challenges. Whether you're looking for an opportunity to share the burden of business ownership or reward your valued employees, or even if you're planning a business exit or a succession, transitioning ownership to employees provides significant benefit to you, to employees and your community. Um, when placed on the traditional market, 80% of businesses fail to sell for a lack of buyer. Employee ownership provides an immediate solution with clear benefits. Uh, as a business owner, um, employee ownership can provide you with a fair market price for the business you've built. Um, along with that value, you can, get you can benefit from significant tax breaks as well. Um, and for the business employees, employee ownership helps preserve jobs and improve business operations. Um, owner to Owners is an Employee Ownership NYC initiative, which is a city-funded program designed to ensure you, the business owner, employees, and the community continue to benefit from the incredible business you've built. Uh, next slide. So you can visit us at owner to owners at NYC today to learn more, um, but it's important to know that employee, uh, owner to owners, oh, go back one more, sorry, Nina. One more slide. Um, owner to Owners provides a complete range of services for business owners and employees through each step of the process. At, at no cost to you, Owner to Owners will help you determine if employee ownership is the right fit for your future and the future of your business. And if not, we'll connect you with the appropriate city services. But if so, we can provide a number of services, including an initial, an initial consultation and eligibility assessment, uh, business valuation, uh, access to capital to execute the sale, guidance through the sale process, as well as training and education for founders, managers, and staff to support a successful ownership transition. Again, we wanna make sure that you are successful as well as your business for the long term. Uh, next slide. So find out if employee ownership is right for you. Uh, give us a call today or visit ownertoowners.nyc. You can call us uh, at 646-363-6592. Um, and now we're going to go ahead and uh, Give a little space for any questions for our panel um, or about the program itself. Great, thank you so much, Julian. Um, so we have uh, several of our owner to owners partners here to answer any questions that y'all might have about the owner to owners program. Um, so that includes um, Alice Maggio, who is with the Working World, um, which provides a cooperative uh, finance um, provisions and technical assistance. We have Shelly Miller from the ICA group, um, which uh, as Red spoke about is supporting blue stockings and their conversion to worker ownership. And then we also have uh, Quincy from Bachnet. Um, and they're all here to answer any questions that you might have. We already have one in the chat. Um, it is uh, specifically for um, Red. And it is, uh, I would love to hear about what you think other co-ops can help uh, in their community and seek to address community needs um, that Blue Stockings has done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Leslie, for that question. Um, so I had attempted to just offer a little bit in the chat, um, but happy to share here too. I really think it is about connecting to existing 
vibrant organizations in our own neighborhoods and community, right? Um, and being able to identify the work that's already going on um, so that we can best plug in and, and support those efforts, figure out where the gaps are, right? Assess capacity and then plug in where we're able. And so for Blue Stockings, which is a queer, trans and current and former sex working and disabled like led organization, right, in business, we come from those communities, we know that we can have a lot, we have a lot to offer um, other cooperatives, um, other neighborhood businesses, and just organizations, and how people show up for sex working people, and how people show up for drug using people or housing insecure people in our neighborhood. Um, and so we've really um, had a wonderful time partnering with um, organizations like the Living Pantry. Um, we've been doing work with um, kind of local harm reduction um, organizations and activists to provide overdose prevention trainings um, and to continue that work, uh, making sure that people have fentanyl testing strips, that people have um, that can carry Narcan on them and know how to use it. Um, and also amplifying community fridges um, before we reopened just a few weeks ago, we had a beautiful hygiene kit assembly event happen in our space. It was like our first kind of blessing of the space. It was so amazing to have so many people um, safely show up <laughs> and assemble over 300 hygiene kits for distribution. Um, and so we have just over like 150 kits left, which is both incredible and also terrible that that much resource distribution has to happen still um, in our city for our people, right? Um, but we're a proud distribution site for those hygiene kits that include lots of essentials, non-perishables um, and uh, necessity items, right? And so it really is about knowing your neighbors and being unapologetically and unabashedly like compassionate and empathetic <laughs> with all of your people um, and, and connecting and talking to one another um, and becoming less afraid to have that messiness play out in our spaces, right? And just embrace it, right? Just continue to embrace our neighbors and our people. And I, th I think that's how we'll move toward um, a more just um, and equitable neighborhood and by extension world. Great, thank you, Rad. Um, and as a, as a quick follow-up, what advice would you give to a business considering transition to employee ownership? Get on the right side of history, do it. <laughs> this is, there, there is, um, there's very little I can say um, to, um, to, go, to go against this decision. It's, it's difficult, um, but it's important. It's crucial um, and it will continue to offer the best chance that workforces have to really claiming power that they are that we already have within us, right? We make the world turn. Workers make this world go round. And it's imperative that we are able to make the decisions about our lives, our workplaces, our livelihoods, our futures, um, and make those decisions together, right? Um, and this is just one piece of that puzzle. Great, thank you so much. Um, so our next question um, for Shelly, how long does it take to become employee-owned to Shelly at uh, ICA Group? That really depends a lot on, on the organization, the business owner involved. Um, we'll tell you it won't take, I mean, it can take as little as six months, but it's not likely you should plan on it taking at least a, a year. If you are if you don't have all your papers together, kind of your team together, the relationship you need to have with your employees together, then it can take up to two years. And then, which happens in all transitions, there's a lot of different emotions that, that owners have, like when we're dealing with conversions, a lot of times owners are exiting. And, um, you know, they kind of go back and forth emotionally with letting go of this baby that they raised up from the beginning. So that can also delay time. But ideally, I would tell people to have a, a year in their mind. But uh, if it's something you want to do, the sooner the better in terms of starting to connect, you know, 
even up to five years before you're ready to totally transfer because you can do these gradually over time. Great, thank you, Shelly. Quincy, do you want to add to that based on your experience as well, for anything you've seen? All right, I think I'm unmuted. Um, so, you know, we've seen a number of different examples, um, especially in the kind of, we're focused a lot on the legacy industrial manufacturing businesses on conversion. Um, and, you know, those transitions take a while. Um, many times it's, you know, generations that a family has owned a business and kind of transitioning to the new leadership of employees uh, uh, takes a while. Additionally, I think just, uh, I think having an owner wrap their head around that, uh, you know, that they can sell their business to their employees um, and, you know, really taking the leap to do that uh, takes time. So it's, it's not something that we see as um, some one day to the next type of transaction. Um, and, you know, it, it does require um, the cooperation of the of the owner who's transitioning out, so. Great, thank you, Quincy. And we have two, room for one more question. Um, so, real quick for Catherine Red, does making decisions together slow down your business or make negotiations with family? Cat, do you want to go first? Sure, sorry, um, I got kicked off my internet drop. So um, I would say in some cases, yes. Um, and I think that that's okay. Um, I think that there's um, this kind of feeling of urgency in our society that um, we've got to constantly go faster, bigger, better all the time. And, and that's not sustainable. Um, I think it's much more valuable and important for to get buy-in from all the workers who the decisions will affect. And, um, and in that way, yes, it, sometimes it takes a little longer, but also it doesn't have to, it, depending on how you structure your cooperative, you know, there are as many types of cooperative structures as there are co-ops because it really has to be individual to that particular group of people. So if you have a really clear structure around who decides what, um, it doesn't have to slow down that much at all. So you're not going to make, you know, the full group of members make every little decision about the business. So, um, so I would say yes and no, it really has to do with how you, you know, structure your business and, and how well you all communicate. I'd have to agree with that, Kat. Um, I think in, in our case, it really does um, help combat that like crisis culture kind of faux urgency um, dynamic that is so prevalent, right? In, in kind of capitalist um, <laughs> everything. Um, and so as like disabled neurodivergent mad people, um, slowing down, taking time, thinking through things together um, has been incredibly empowering and has made um, our decision-making and our, our workflow together so much stronger. Um, it also leaves space for conflict and, and, um, and being brave around seeking different solutions and being creative to take that time using consensus-based decision-making. And also, on the other hand, it sometimes reduces the kind of time that would have been eaten up by kind of bureaucratic, managerial, random, weird policies that, you know, workers aren't creating for themselves, but are kind of sometimes put upon us by employers. And so we're cutting through all of that. We are assessing what's going on for ourselves um, and not waiting for those, those kind of dictates to be handed to us and then have to act accordingly. So it, often it actually reduces some of that kind of clunky, strange time too um, that can happen in a, in a workplace. Awesome. Well, we have such a rich um, responses happening in the chat right now. And um, thanks so much to everyone who joined. Um, Frank Gonzalez, um, absolutely. We'd love to, to reach out to y'all um, with the LESSBA. Um, and uh, for those who are interested in following up with us after about owner to owners, please do. I know we're a little over time, so I'm just grateful for everyone taking the time today. Thank you so much to, uh, to Red, to Kat, to um, 
all the folks that have joined us today. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for facilitating this as well. I'm really excited to see what happens next and how we can make uh, New York City a more cooperative place. Um, so thank you again and hope to talk to you all soon.